Oh. Santana has got his ritual with every player. And some of them don't look like they know what to expect. <laughs> and Parnell looking like, what am I supposed to do? Because Parnell's usually on the bullpen. And he's Par not he's not used to true. this. And Parnell's very laid back and relaxed. And it's, he may have been alarmed. But Santana, of course, he plays once every fifth day. And, boy, he puts everything into that fifth day. He's got the old uh, razor routine with razor shines. He even takes care of the bat boys. Now that's a guy who's good in the clubhouse. You should. You should always take care of the clubbies. That's right. Starting lineup brought to you by Toyota, a smart way to keep moving forward. Matt Dias has had himself a huge series so far. Seven RBIs in the first two games, and he has great career numbers against Johan Santana. Braves continue to play without Martin Prado, who was pronounced uh, to have what were called exertional headaches and will be back with the Braves soon. Isn't that like heat prostration? No. Yeah. I think they're saying that uh, the exertion of playing caused the headaches, so they're giving him anti-inflammatories, and yeah. they're hoping that he'll be able to play before too terribly long. Okay. Everything's so complicated today. Used to be if you had a headache, you just you had know, a headache. Yeah, right? Heat prostration. You, know, you get headaches. You get headaches from that, particularly when you're exerting yourself. <laughs> no, we're gonna go to the Chevy defense, and that's brought to you by ChevyOffers.com and Frank Core nine outfield assists this season, three with the Mets. The one thing I've said about Mr. Frank Core, he's very, very good at charging base hits and picking up the ball and getting rid of it and throwing an accurately accurate strong throw to whatever base he's throwing to he's excels in that and Frank Clore having some fun with the fans there in the uh, front of the Models it's hard to toss a baseball into the the Models clubhouse down there because there's no opening right it's, it's uh, screened off so I'm sure the kids there wanted uh, Wanted Jeff to give them the baseball, but all he could do was toss it to the fans in the stands above. Johan has pitched uh, 13 and a third innings against the Braves this year and not allowed an earned run. That's a nice seat out there in the bridge terrace seating where two home runs landed last night. Yeah, right, right above that Dunkin' Donuts sign and the wise uh, potato chips. Omar Infante will lead things off for Atlanta. Infante three for nine in this series with three RBIs. Now an interesting call for Bobby Cox tonight. Infante has been playing the last few days at second base since coming back from the disabled list. His career numbers against Johan Santana just two for 24. Kelly Johnson, who has not been starting much lately, has great numbers against Santana, but Bobby opting for the right-handed bat and the hotter hitter in Infante tonight. Well, Bobby's got. Uh some left-hand hitters in this lineup four to be exact. I don't think he wanted to add another one So Santana ready to start the night and his first pitch fastball is high for ball one Here's Bobby 14 straight division titles that streak ended in 2005 there's a strike and it's one and one to Infante I tell you what Roger McDowell who is the pitching coach for the Braves and ultimately hired by uh, Bobby Cox just sings Bobby's praises. Loves the man. Infante lifts one to left center, and Pagan is there to play it. And that's the first out of the night. Well, I have never heard any player leave the Atlanta Braves and say anything bad about Bobby Cox. I think it's a matter of uh, respect. And let me tell you something. He's cracked the whip on some players, too. Uh, Andrew Jones comes to mind when Andrew Jones first came up. The all-star gold glover that played center field so wonderfully for the Braves all those years. Uh, he was dogged a few games and Bobby did not put up with it and uh, Andrew Jones another guy that speaks very highly of Bob. And so. you saw Cox in the dugout standing with um, Yunel Escobar and chatting with him and Escobar is a guy who Bobby has had to rein in a little bit and he has responded. Here's Garrett Anderson and he takes a strike. I mean there's a perception that these days, it's impossible to discipline players. I'm not sure if that's really true. Well, it's all about. Oh, nice pitch by Santana there. It's all about 
the players, it, it, it's whether they, they, they don't have to like you, but it's grud grudging respect. I mean, you are, the, the manager is the captain of the ship. So Gary Sheffield, who played for Bobby Cox in Atlanta, Anderson lunging for the changeup and fouls it off. Chipper Jones waiting on deck. Santana last start against the Giants was not at his best. He gave up four runs and nine hits over six and two thirds. That night that day ended with him hitting Benji Molina with a pitch. In a final retaliation perhaps for David Wright getting hit in the head. And uh, Santana was defiant after the game in talking about retaliation and his role. Struck out Anderson and that's the second out. And there was some thought that Santana might be suspended for his actions, particularly after saying what he said, as you look at the last pitch to Anderson. But he was merely fined and not suspended. No, just a head in the count and throws a slider in the dirt. After going up the ladder, and here's the man that's always been a thorn in the Mets' side. Mets have held him in check so far in this series, 0 for 6, and as you see there, 0 for his last 13. Chipper hitting a 290 on the year. Right-handed has always been Chipper's weaker side. They actually have more home runs righty than lefty this year. Lefts went out to Frank Corey at right, and Santana off to a good start. Sets the Braves down one, two, three. Mets come up in the bottom of the first with no score. Way to keep moving forward. Gary Sheffield was a late scratch tonight. In Jerry Manuel's words, he had to clear some thoughts. Hmm. Hopefully, we'll find out more about that later. So, that meant Corey Sullivan on his 30th birthday was inserted into the lineup, and Corey will play left field in bat fifth. And the night starter, the fifth starter for this ball club, Kenshin Kawakawa. And you can see right there in 22 starts. He's got a split finger, slider. He's not overpowering. He's not the spring chicken he used to be. And uh, with the loss of the fastball, he throws more split fingers. And we'll take a look at the defense brought to you by ChevyOffers.com. And we see McCann, who's thrown out a runner in, in this series already. He's thrown out 17 of 75. I can't say that is stellar. But a lot of times, you know, guys steal off the pitcher. We'll cut him some slack. Slack cut. He can hit. Yes, he can. Angel Pagan leads off for New York. Pagan two for nine in this series. Hitting a 283 for the year. And Angel's come back since that injury the, with the hamstring and has stayed healthy and played well. Hey. 
know, for just about everybody in this lineup tonight. These last 42 games are a proving ground to try and show that they belong on this ball club next year. Well, with the loss last night, the Mets were pushed back now 13 and a half behind Philadelphia, who just after getting swept, what, what 10, 12 days ago at home by the Marlins. She'd have just gone on a tear. You look at Jeremy Reed right there. So they pushed the Mets further back. And also, the Mets are falling way out of contention in the wild card. So this has become a proving ground. And uh, there's a lot to be gained for people like Angel Pagan and Corey Sullivan and Anderson Hernandez. And Castillo is one of the few Mets who is under contract for next year. Here's J.J. Putz, who is getting very close to starting a rehab assignment. That's got Billy Wagner back tonight. He is active, available for duty, and Jerry said he would love to get him into a game in the sixth, seventh, or eighth if he can find Billy a clean inning where he can throw fewer than 20 pitches. Well, as I said, you've got four left-handers in this lineup tonight. There'll be plenty. There'll, there'll be opportunity for Billy to get in, and I'm looking forward to that. Again, the 0-2 and a curveball strikes out Pagan. So Kawakami gets the best of Pagan, and that's the first out. Well, this is the one thing Pagan needs to work on that I've seen Angel, and he's he's done a great job. There's the you see with the seams right there. Actually, he's throwing a four seam because it's a breaking ball. Excuse me. And off speed is out of the strike zone. Getting back to Pagan. Pagan needs to work on being a better off speed hitter. He gets tends to get fooled with off speed pitches, particularly from the left side. Here's Luis Castillo, who's now 10th in the National League in batting with that 310 average. First time he's been in the top 10 this year. Five for seven in this series. I thought the, um, the post-game comments of Jerry Manuel were very interesting regarding Castillo last night. He chastised Louis in the booth for not moving on a ground ball hit to shortstop, and Anderson Hernandez thought Louis was going to be at second, had to pump fake there, threw too late to first, opened the door for a huge inning for the Braves. And Jerry mostly absolved Louis of responsibility, at least in terms of his not moving. He well, said that it was a communication problem. Yes, he was playing to pull and had a long way to go to second base, but he's got to make more than one step to second base. And Yet he's also got to communicate with Anderson Hernandez. He has to communicate with Anderson Hernandez. Say, call him. Go, Andy. I'm over here. I'm way in the hole. Ground ball hit to you. I may not get there. Go to first. But you know, I just didn't. What I didn't like was Louis just made one, you know, token step and stopped. On three and one, he bunts. Now, three and two. See. We're kind of catching it late here, um, but it was just one step from Louis. Louis. Louis had run ten steps over there, and then you realize he hasn't, didn't have it, maybe didn't, couldn't get there in time. By the same token, so really, you've got to let the shortstop know and the third baseman. The ground ball to you. I'm, I can't get there. I'm way. I'm playing the pull. I always feel you can play the pull, but you cannot play so much to pull where you can't cover the force out. Castillo yeah, draws a one-out walk. Well, you know, watching the play with the naked eye last night, I mean, it's one thing if you're playing the pull like teams play against uh, Carlos Delgado or, or Barry Bonds, but he wasn't that far in the hole. I mean, he's maybe 40 feet from second base, and the base runner's 80 feet from second base. Why would he not be able to beat the runner there? Well, like I said, I, you can see right there now, the defense at the middle infield right now that's that's double play depth mm -hmm. now granted you haven't got you know a dead pull hitter in Murphy and I forget who the hitter was last night it was uh, Garrett Anderson okay so Anderson is not really that much of a pull hitter but okay they want him to play in the pull fine I still say you can't play so much the pull where you can't cover on a force out you've got to be able to get there and you at least got to make an effort to get there Pulled, just foul. And I think at the end of the day, for a fan watching, the worst part is it looked really bad. That Louis barely moved. Well, you know, it's water under the bridge. 
Hopefully it won't happen again. And you said it one, a couple of times. This is not the first time that it's happened with Louie as far as not covering second base. There's been some, we call it vapor locks. Well, one thing is for certain, Castillo has continued to play brilliantly on offense. His on-base percentage is over 400. He's hitting 310 for the year. He's played well in the field, too. He is, you know, he doesn't have the range he used to have with Gold Glover uh, with, with the Marlins and a fine fielder. He has played a very, very good second base. Kawakami ahead on Murphy 0 and 2, and he strikes him out, going up and away with a fastball. Second strike out of the inning for Kawakami. Oh, up the ladder. This is going to be a fastball, probably a four seamer. Can't tell. And he goes upstairs, and Murph chases. So two away. I did that in the '86 playoffs against Nolan Ryan, right? That's Shea. You think Ryan was throwing harder than 88? Yes. Ryan threw me a fastball that just out, outside corner. I swear it was around letter high, and when the time I swung was up in my eyes. Of course, Dolan Ryan will be here on Saturday night with all the other 1969 Mets for the big celebration honoring the 40th anniversary of that first Mets championship team. And uh, while Ryan is in town, along with Tom Seaver and Jerry Kuzman, Ron Darling is going to sit down with the three of them and do an SNY spotlight that will air in September. That should be a fascinating conversation. That'll be wonderful. Frank Kerr lines one in the right center for a base hit. Castillo turns second. Diaz does a nice job cutting it off, so Castillo has to be held at third as Frank Kerr pulls in with a double. 19th double of the year for Jeff Francoeur. Well, Francoeur continues to hit. This was a splitter. It did nothing. Just said, here, hit me. And hit me hard. And drive me into the opposite field. Nice play by Diaz on the slide there. That ball gets by and Castillo scores. Prevents the run from scoring. I always love those pictures, Gary, that say, here, hit me. Is it in... Uh a certain color writing or baseball can be very uh, masochistic at times. Well, here's Corey Sullivan who's celebrating his 30th birthday today and a chance to give himself a birthday present here. He's already gotten one. He wasn't supposed to be in the starting lineup tonight, but was inserted when Gary Sheffield was scratched. Corey hitting a 274 and he takes upstairs for ball one. I like Sullivan. Much better in the corner outfield position, left field and right. But then again, if Beltron is healthy, you know, there's your center fielder. But Beltron has been unhealthy for quite a long time. Well, what you got here with uh, Pagan and Sullivan getting a lot of playing time down the stretch is really a competition for a potential job next year. So Kawakami has been awfully good with runners in scoring position lately. Getting himself out of jams. There's a strike. Borderline two and one. Mm -hmm. Borderline knees. Little cutter in. I like these uniforms. These are my favorite uniforms. Better than the pinstripes? Well, I like them both. I like the piping around the neck. Uh, the old fashioned piping. I really like that. Mm. But I'm an old fashioned guy. More and more. You know why that is? Tell me. Keep getting older. Isn't there a drink called an old fashioned? <laughs> yes, there is. <laughs> I believe it's become popular again. Here's the 3 1. Driven toward the left field line, and that'll go foul. I'll we'll have to ask our uh, director, Bill Webb, about the old fashioned. I'm sure he knows what it's all about. What would he know? He's a connoisseur. A nice grab. Nice to see Reyes. Very nice. That's a big glove. That's an outfielder's glove. Who's he barking at? Oh, he's just having fun. <laughs> Three and two to Sullivan with two in scoring position and two out. 
Now Akami about to throw his 22nd pitch of the first inning. And trying to find some agreement with Brian McCann. And they will talk it over. Kenshi and Kawakami spent 11 years pitching for the Chinichi Dragons in Japan. Won 112 games, lost only 72. At his best year in 2006 when he went 17 and 7 with a 2.51 ERA. But the thing about pitching in Japan, those pitchers make 22 to 25 starts a year. Correct. So 17 is like winning 20. Shorter season, correct? It is. And there's ball four. Well, they also pitch most usually every seventh day instead of every fifth day. And so now you get to this point in the season in the middle of August, and all of a sudden, when you're pitching in the States for the first time, these Japanese pitchers are getting to a, a number of starts that they haven't seen before. Well, look what happened up in Boston with their young uh, Japanese ace last year, who had a terrific year last year, and now he's got a Got a sore wing. Well, the bases are loaded for Fernando Tatis, who has hit a couple of grand slams this year. Eight for his career. And the first pitch curveball in for a strike. Boy, that's a good pitch right there. They know that Tatis is a middle in fastball first pitch hitter. Look at this off speed curve. Beautiful pitch. Fernando starting his fifth straight game at third base since David Wright went down. And now Kawakami ahead of him 0 and 2. Brian Schneider, who has really been struggling at the plate, hitting seventh in the order, he's on deck. Well, Brian's stay here, brief tenure with the Mets, has just been riddled with injuries. See the career numbers for Tatis with the bases loaded. Those are outstanding. But the Mets is a team this year with the bases loaded, not so good. Oh boy, that was a hanger right there. Tatis has just been out in front all year. And then when it seems like when he there's the grip right there. When this is hanging right down the middle. Oh boy. And that's see how out in front he is off the end of the bat? He's just too quick. He has been caught in between all year long. When he's tried to go the other way, he gets jammed. When he tries, when he, when he gets out in front, he's off the end of the bat. He just hasn't been able to find his groove. Go oh, to fastball outside. Mm -hmm. You know, last year he was just tremendous with this ball club and the National League Comeback Player of the Year. And he was a real critical injury down that stretch run when he separated his shoulder in Washington in the middle of the month. I'm getting a chance to play every day right now at his most comfortable position, third base. Two and two now to Tatis. Mentioned those Mets numbers with the bases loaded. Bases loaded and two out this year. The Mets as a team are four for 48. That's 083 with two outs. Two out, bases loaded. No two outs, always the toughest RBI. But that's Death Valley. They could use a hit here from Tatis. Two and two from Kawakami. Bounce slowly. In comes Chipper Jones. And he gets Tatis. Make it four for 49. Kawakami escapes the first inning. No score.
Bases in the bottom of the first, but couldn't push a run across against Kenshin Kawakami. Uh -huh. There's a family out enjoying the, the early evening. Glad to see he got a, his cell phone at top of the game to start again. <laughs> Brian McCann will lead off for the Braves in the second inning against Johan Santana. McCann has really struggled this year against lefties more than he ever has before. He's hitting just 202 against left-handers this year. He had a good, a good game against Oliver Perez. Mm -hmm. Hit the ball hard off Ollie. By the way, Ollie threw a bullpen session today, pronounced himself fit to go for Sunday. So he'll match up against Pedro? Yes, he will. Phillies come in tomorrow night for the first of four. It's Pelfrey against Hamels tomorrow night. Tim Redding will get the start with the release of Levon Hernandez on Saturday against Jay Happ. And Oliver Perez against Pedro Martinez Sunday afternoon. And Bobby Parnell against Cliff Lee on Monday afternoon. Well, hopefully... Hurricane Bill will just keep its projected course and veer off to the east. But we're going to have some high winds, and I'm going to go to the beach. I'm, I'm off on Sunday. We'll miss you. Castillo with a nice play going to his left. And he can't retire one away. Well, they're supposed to be. This SAP portion of today's broadcast is brought to you by LATV, the PIX digital alternative. Check out the variety LATV has to offer. Well, I'm not going to go swimming. I mean, I'm just going to go gonna, surfing. I'm going to take the dog. No, I'm going to take the dog, and uh, supposedly there'll be a lot of waves, big waves from the swells coming in. Now, try not to get in the way of these surfers because, you know, they always come out when the I waves grew up on the, I grew up in Surf City. I stay away from those surfers. Did you ever uh, get on board? Try, yeah. No, I was always a surf mat or a body surf. The water was too cold. Well, that's why they, that's why they have wetsuits. Oh, I hated putting the wetsuit on. It is a pain in the neck. Well, you have to, you know, you have to be slim to wear the wetsuit. But when I was a kid, I was very yeah, I'm just saying. I wasn't, I wasn't talking about you specifically. I was saying one needs to be slim to wear a wetsuit because it looks really bad. Otherwise. They were just a pain in the neck to put on. Udell Escobar, four for nine in this series. And he lines one to right field and stays up for Frank Coor, two out. Well, I'll tell you what, Escobar, from the day he stepped into the foot on the big league diamond, the first time we saw him, we knew he had potential to be some kind of hitter. He is. So two out and nobody on. Now Matt Diaz, who has some uh, rather remarkable career numbers against Johan Santana, 11 for 20 with a home run. He's had his way with uh, Diaz this year. And he seems to be Diaz looking for the off-speed pitch. He gets the fastball and vice versa. But we'll see what happens. It's a new game. And it's been a great series for Diaz. Hit a three-run homer on Tuesday night and then drove in four runs, including a two-run homer last night, an opposite field shot. Browns went right back to Santana. And the Gold Glover throws him out. Six up and six down for Santana to start the night. Mets come up in the bottom of the second. Still no score.
you by ChevyOffers.com. Find your nearest dealer on ChevyOffers.com. Well, in the first game of the series, the uh, Braves had to take a player out in the first inning while Martin Prado came up with headaches, and Bobby Cox had to play short. Well, not apparently something has befallen Garrett Anderson because he's leaving the game, and Reed Gorecki, the Long Islander, has come on to play left field. And Gorecki got his first major league hit in this series. And now Bobby Cox has only three men on his bench. Of course, Prado was... Uh, in Atlanta yesterday, not sure whether he's actually back here in New York or not, but not available after the headaches that he suffered. It was home plate umpire Paul Nard. I think, I guess that Bobby had not told Nard that there was a change in left field. And uh, Nard went, I guess somebody yelled from the Mets dugout and said, what's going on? And I guess now Nard has been informed. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Inconsequential. Aren't they supposed to tell the umpire if they make a change? They should. Brian Schneider leads off the home second. It has been a rough go for Schneider. Four for his last 43. And his average has dropped to 186 for the season. It'll be Schneider, then Anderson Hernandez, and Johan Santana in the home second. And as Schneider's batting average has shrunk, so has his playing time. Almir Santos has been playing more and more. Escobar throws out Schneider one away. I'll tell you what, I, I do 105 games in the course of a season, Gary, and not nearly as much as you. And I tell you what, these infields around Major League Baseball, you very rarely see a bat hop. They are in such great shape. I mean, at Old Shea, you know, Pete Flynn was the was the head groundskeeper there, and I love that infield. I know Hojo said some disparaging things about that infield, but I always thought it was a wonderful infield. But all the ballparks today are terrific. It's Anderson Hernandez who bounces one foul. Well, the worst one that I can recall in the years that I've been doing games was the old stadium in Atlanta. Yes. Um, they used that red clay there. And what happened was so hot that it would, the guys would, I, the guys would round first base more than any other base. And I'd always have to do my gardening there because they would take a turn around the base and take a big divot up with their cleats. And that's bad hop. That spells bad hop. Greg one attempt popped up to LaRoche for the second half. I can tell you, Gary, in the 70s, San Diego was an awful infield. Um, I'm trying to think of another one. In spring training, Bradenton was, you know, I wish I could go out there with a mask. You can see how close the grass is to the dirt there on the lip. Used to be that you get that big drop off, and if the ball hit the lip, it would take a kangaroo hop. That doesn't happen as much anymore. That never bothered me so much. What bothered me more on the lip of the grass, when it was a more of a higher elevation, was hitting the backside of the lip and the scoot flat down. Yep. Yeah. Here's Santana, and he takes a strike. But you're right. I mean, the standard has become so much better. You almost never see a bad hop. It is just. I mean, you have complete faith in the infields. Started at Kansas City with the grounds crew there, the groundskeeper there, George Toma. Yep, and um, I think they all use the same kind of dirt, whatever they, the, the chemistry or the mix of specific dirt, it's all uniform now. Uh, where before you always had dirt from that area. And uh, I tell you, Atlanta was awful, as we said, and San Diego was awful. And, of course, the uh, the drainage on these fields is so much better now, too, and that, that has to play a factor. Able to get the right moisture level. I mean, the other night when we had that huge storm after the game, they didn't cover the field. They just let it absorb the moisture. Right. They knew they'd have plenty of time to clean it up. That's right. They only covered home plate in the pitcher's mound. Mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, you know, in, at Shea for, for many years before you got there, and Santana goes down swinging, the Mets shared the ballpark with the Jets. And that happened in a lot of ballparks back in the day, multi-purpose stadiums. They do it in Miami still. Yeah, it doesn't really help that stadium, does it? No score as we go to the third.
By Verizon Fios, this is Fios, this is big. Kenji and Kawakami reaching 92 on the gun early in this game, and Johan Santana 91. Now there's a good looking group in the stands tonight. I wasn't looking at the monitor. You're right. You're very perceptive. Excellent taste. Adam LaRoche will lead off the third inning for the Braves. LaRoche is homered in this series. And he pops this one a mile high in foul ground. And so Tatis watches it hit the dugout roof. Well, in just uh, a few moments, perhaps in the bottom of the third, Tom Seaver will be joining us here in the booth. The leader of the Miracle Mets of 1969, who will be gathering this weekend for the 40th anniversary celebration. Pull down to first and pass the dive of Daniel Murphy and down the line. LaRoche heads to second. And pulls in with a leadoff double, and LaRoche continues to scorch the ball since coming back to Atlanta. I'll tell you something, Adam LaRoche is really a nice player, and I think, I think he's very much under the radar screen. Nice effort by Murph right there. And this is a tough left-hander out there, one of the best pitchers in the game. And LaRoche is a journeyman player. It's interesting that both sons, his father of Major League pitcher, had two sons that are hitters. Of course, his brother Andy still in Pittsburgh playing third base. Here's Ryan Church who had a big night last night with three hits. Ryan hitting 262 since joining the Braves. So Atlanta has their first hit off Santana. And a call strike to Church. Frank Cor, the first night of the series, had three hits. Last night, Church, touche, three hits of his own. <laughs> On guard. Bryant has uh, been installed lately in that number eight spot of the batting order, which cannot be easy for a guy who's used to hitting a little higher in the order. Just don't see the quality of pitches batting eight that you might hitting sixth or seventh. Pull down to first, and that's a fair ball. And that'll bring in the first run of the game. Back to back doubles by LaRoche and Church, and the Braves lead one nothing. Two left handers back to back, Gary. It was, it was the right pitch. First run of the game brought to you by your Cadillac dealers. Well, we had too much play. Change up. Up. And too much play. And give Church credit. Stayed back right over the bag almost. Just inside of it. So LaRoche and Church, the seven and eight hitters, both left-hand hitters. Back-to-back -back doubles. Now the pitcher Kawakami looking to bunt and fouls it back. Kawakami has four hits and three sacrifices in his first year in the big leagues. You saw Tatis on that bunt attempt. He did not aggressively charge. He has to stay there. And it's up to the pitcher to bunt it down the third baseline and force Tatis to field the ball. Watch Tatis. Right there. See, he's kind of hanging around, and if you, as a pitcher, you've got to bunt it down that line and force that cease to vacate third base. Bunt it toward third, and so Tatis does have to play it, and the sacrifice successful, moving Church over to third. I feel like Professor Ludwig von Drake there with a, quite to say it, and it was just perfectly. The perfect textbook, what you do, not, not bunting it in the air, but see, Tatis has to come in and field. No one's there to cover third base. It's an automatic. You could have telestrated before the play started. 
Did you like uh, Ludwig von Drake? Remember Donald Duck's character? I'm more familiar with Mr. Whoopi. <laughs> I brought. That's right. Tennessee tuxedo. Yes. Chumley. Chumley. Don Adams was the voice of Tennessee tuxedo. Yes, he was. Who was Chumley? I uh, don't know. Infield in. Omar Infante, the batter, flied out to center his first time, and he chases the changeup out of the strike zone. Nothing in one. Infante now just two for 25 against Santana. You weren't a Disney guy? Not so much. Okay. That was more uh, Daffy than Donald. One and one to Santana. Reed Gorecki, the Long Islander, who took over for Garrett Anderson in left field. We're told Anderson left with a lower back strain, and that's why Gorecki's in the game. On top of the plate, Infante. Well, Santana and Schneider have taken a lot of time getting together here. Two change-ups to start this at bat off. This is a lot like John Tudor, the fine Cardinal pitcher of the 80s. Similar stuff. They wanted the cambio there. No change up. Away. Oh boy, just missed. Santana wanted that one. So three straight change ups to Infante. If you throw the change up too much to a single batter, can it start to backfire on you? Well, you've got to pitch inside. You've got to mix them up. And that's. What makes Santana so tough is that you got to use both sides of the plate, and really, every pitcher does. But when you got a great changeup, you just can't live out there. I remember uh, Bert Houghton was with the Dodgers, and he learned the changeup from I forget who, one of the pitchers on the staff, when he went over to the Dodgers. And I'll make a point real quick after this pitch here. Another change, four in a row. So the book on Infante is he's a young hitter who wants to hit a fastball. Hooten through the knuckle curve and fastball. When he developed that changeup, he went around the league the first time and got people out because all of a sudden it was a new pitch. Right. I got up against him in Dodger Stadium and he had got me out in St. Louis with the changeup. And I knew he was going to throw it. It was late in the game. It was a tie ball game, one run game. And I went down my baby finger on the knob of the bat just to get a little longer length on the bat. I knew he was going to throw me the changeup with two strikes, and he did. And I hit a line drive right at the right fielder to get the run in. Monte to center field. Pagan gets in front of it. Tagging it third is Church. And the throw for Pagan offline. 2 0 Atlanta. Sacrifice fly for Infante. Well, I believe that was five straight change ups. So a pretty good at bat there by Infante. And it is another change. And it's out over the plate, but he was just protecting. And he got it up, too. Ball tails. There's the there's the grip. Watch the ball move away, but it, see it's up, right there. You want it down. So two runs in against Santana here in the third. Back to back doubles and a sacrifice bunt and a sacrifice fly. And now Reed Gorecki, who picked up his first big league hit last night, takes a change up for a strike. Well, here's the grip, and you see that's that circle change. He's got the three fingers spread out over the ball. And then the fourth index is kind of a circle around the ball, on the side of the ball. Pop up for Anderson Hernandez to handle. And that retires the side, but the Braves played a pair on back-to-back -back doubles by LaRoche and Church. So Santana touched up for a pair. Tom Seaver joins us when we come back for the bottom of the third with the Braves up 2 0.
the unmistakable images of the greatest player in the history of the Mets franchise. That would be Tom Seaver, and we're so happy to have Tom with us in anticipation of the celebration of the 40th anniversary of the 69 Mets. I got a lot of time. You can keep running those things. That's kind of fun to watch. You like know? Robert Redford, the way we were. <laughs> That's right. There is a past tense verb in there, right? <laughs> Sorry. How have you been? I want to see some of those mechanics in you know, pass that pass that word along again, too, by the way. Been fine, thank you. How have you been? Good. Things are good. Yeah, everything's great. Yeah. Be a happy night Saturday night, don't you think? Yeah. yeah. Who are you? I think you'd be very happy. Who are you looking most forward to seeing? I mean, some, many people have, uh, have said that. And I would say, you know, Gil is the obvious one. And if you talk about the people that you, really you're not going to see. And of all the ones, the players that I, I think I really would like to see, uh, certainly Tug would be right in that mix. But Don Cardwell, I would love to see him. That would be, uh, that would be a joy for me because he was the crusty veteran on the ball club. Uh, that last, that last, you know, he just he passed on so much information in that picture. Let me see if I can find number 27, top left, Don Cardwell, and he pitched for the Pirates and uh, came over here, and he was kind of a, like the fatherly figure to to all of us that came along, and, uh, and that would be that's probably the one person I would like to see here. And the fifth starter, and I, it, it, it yeah. raises an interesting point because I don't think we've talked about this enough over the years, you know. Four starters was the norm before, <coughs> excuse me, yes. before the late 60s, and, and I could think Rube Walker had a big hand in advocating the five-man rotation. And I look at, you know, you and Kuzman and Ryan and, and the long careers right. you have. How much did that help you guys? The fact that you were pitching mostly every fifth day rather than every fourth. Um, it is, it's difficult to say, Gary, but it, but it, it certainly was an advantage in the sense uh, that we had, we were going to throw, still going to throw 270 innings, 250, 270 innings, but we were going to get an extra day's rest. And that we didn't have some arbitrary pitch count, whereas if you got X number, you're gone, you know. Uh, and I, there was no question that Gill and Rube uh, wanted to push the envelope there, and he had tremendous talent. And when you think about it, when you've got, you've got Ryan and Gentry and Seaver and Kuzman and stuff, I mean, you've got some guys that can really throw. And mechanics were all part of it. Um, but he felt that you were going to get, for the most part, you're going to get the same, maybe, you know, slighter percentage, fewer uh, in his pitch. You might not get 300, but you're going to get 275, 260, whatever, and you may, may have a higher percentage of effective pitches. And you can do that when you have pitching. If you don't have the pitching, you can't manufacture it. You can't make a, get a magic wand and make this thing happen, you know. And you have to have the arms to be able to do that. And at that juncture, when Gil came in 68, we were, you know, we had that kind of arms. Now, 69 was your third season. That's correct. 68 was Gill's first. That's right. What was different in 69 that wasn't there in 68? A um, couple more pitchers. Um, same catcher, Jerry Grody. Uh, same shortstop, Tommy Agee. Came over to play and center he had field. A terrible year in '68. He had a terrible year in '68, but he could play center field. Uh, and Gill loved him. And. Um, I think it was the maturity of the pitching and the consistency of the pitching. And then all of a sudden, it's maybe it's different than the game today, but all the little things that happen on the field to when a ball game happened, getting a run order over, knocking the ball down. If you know, you talk about a gold glove first baseman, knowing how to play defense and knowing how important that is, along with the hitting that comes, you know, that is on a ball club. So that quote that we posted a moment ago is Castillo and Murphy with back to back hits here. That, that Gil said the most important thing was to change the notion that everything the Mets did was wrong. Yeah, I mean, well, I don't think there's any question of that. I, I think we probably believed that before we even realized that he was trying to change it too. Because we were, you know, we were young. We didn't grow up in New York. We didn't have, we didn't live this clownish uh, uh, moniker that you know the '64, '65, '66 Mets had. We didn't, we didn't. That wasn't us. You know, Jerry Grody in 69, you know, I remember standing in the outfield and I thought he was crazy. He said, you know, we got a chance to win this year. And so, you know, 1969, he's the first guy that said it. Well, he knew that, you know, he knew what the pitching was going to be. You know, he knew that it was five days in a row, who was going to be on that mound you know, trying to stop this other ball club from doing X. 
Right. So clearly you guys had something that you hadn't had before. And yet in the middle of August, you know, you're nine and a half games out. The, the Cubs look like they're the team of destiny that year. Is there something that changed at that point? Because you were good, but then you went from being good to being great, 38 and 11 down the stretch. Joe Hodges? Why? Just being there, probably. Explain. I mean, that's that. It, so it, maybe it is so simplistic that he never changed. And our direction was set on day one. And he never changed over there. A couple of things happened uh, during the course of the season that reiterated how we're going to go about our business. When he walked to left field, and went to see Cleon Jones. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a that was a huge statement. And Cleon Jones was the was the offense in the middle of that lineup, and he had, for him, Gil knew it. He said, "For us, for us to win, he has to play." And Cleon played, and Cleon could play with a he could hit with the best of them. That big huge bat, he get the ball out to right center field, which is you know, hit 340. Then. Oh yeah, I mean, he could he could really play. So. And it was just, it just, there was never, there was never a room to wiggle with Gill for the ball club. There was never, there was never another way, an opposite way, a different way to play the game when you have the uniform on, and when you know you're good and you got a chance to play. It's like, you know, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not pushing Keith's button here and trying to do, inflate him and stuff. But that's the way he played. That's the way he played. That's the way Gil Hodge just demanded everybody to play. Keith wore his, his heart on his sleeve, etc., which is good for a ball club because you get the emotional input into your ball club. If somebody has that kind of emotion, that shows it on the field. But Gill was a guy that demanded it in a very quiet manner. Castillo comes in to get the Mets on the board, and as the throw goes to the backstop, runners advance to second and third, and it's now two to one Atlanta. Well, how many mistakes did the Braves make on that one play? Um, I, I lost count. But we'll go. <laughs> nice hitting by Sullivan here. Here's the first mistake. Too many steps from the outfielder. Here's the second. Misses the cutoff man. Overthrows the catcher. That's three. And very good base running on Murphy's part. He sees the, that the throw is over the cutoff man and advances. And the pitcher was not far enough back to, That's to right. become the backup man. We see that a lot in yes. today's game. It's just like, like a four or five mistakes on one play here. We have. Pitchers forget to back up. Well, he was backing up, but where does he go? Get your rear end back there. He stops right behind the catcher there. He's got another 40 feet to go that he can back up that pipe. Whoops. And a pickoff try at second, and Sullivan just gets back. So oh. it's funny that we're talking about kill, too, because uh, that stuff doesn't happen. Right. You know, that stuff just will not happen. It will, it, 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 it's, not, it's not a professional way to go about your business. And those kind of things, those are the games you'll never win by one run. And that with the defense and pitching and your approach to the game is, you know, I've said it a thousand times, that's how you're going to win one run ball. Games. The other thing that happened in midseason, a little earlier in, in June, was the addition of Don Clendenic. Now, yeah. he had obviously been around more than some of you guys. How much did that make a difference? That was a beautiful play by Infante to end the inning. What did what did Clendenin mean? He made he was the crusty veteran that that reiterated what Gill was brought to the table. You know, and this it, it, Don played in a certain way. Gill wanted his bat. There's no question about it. But he wanted his experience and what he meant as a professional. And Clink was a professional. Tom, thank you so much. Have My a, pleasure. Have a great weekend. Good to see you guys. We'll have fun. Absolutely, Tommy. I'm looking yep. forward to it. Yeah, be fun to be fun to. Share all those wonderful moments. The one and only Tom Seaver.
Scott. The World's Fair Marina. Got a little rowing going on there, a little sunset. You wouldn't know you were right in the middle of the big city, would you? Uh, no. You wouldn't. Can you imagine them when they first came over to this new world, how pristine it was? It must have been mind-blowing. Change a little. Chipper Jones leads off in the fourth inning against Johan Santana, 2-1 to one Atlanta. By the way, uh, we were talking with Tom Seaver, so we didn't get to mention that play by Omar Infante to end that inning, saving two runs and saving the Braves the lead. The diving grab to Rob Fernando Tatis of a hit. One and one to Chipper. Tom keeps singing your praises, and I think I know why now. All pitchers like good fielders. I thought it was because you were oh, I nine stopped. for 46 against them. And guess what? My first is bad off him. I had a pinch hit triple at Bush Stadium. Is that right? Yep. In 1974, and I remember calling home to my parents saying, because there was no satellite TV. Right. I said, you won't believe what I did tonight. What you do, sir? Well, we're losing two to one in the eighth, and Tom, I pinch hit against Tom Seaver. Good change up by Santana. Strikes out Chipper Jones. First strike, second strike out of the night for Santana. So, eighth inning down by a run. Did you drive in a run? Or? No, I was no one on. Uh, was the one out. Pitch it for the pitcher. There's a the grip. That's the old change up grip, and this one's down. Beautiful pitch. And he threw me, uh, was a multi, it was around four pitch at bat, and he threw me up and in fastball. I don't know how I hit it. Where'd you hit it? I hit it in the three, uh, 386 gap in right center field. Line drive, the ball. two iron. And it hit around two feet from being a home run. And then Richie Scheinblum pinched it after me and popped up. And then Tom struck out for the other guy for a third out. Driven to deep right field by McCann. Frank Kerr looking up, and it's in the Pepsi porch. Brian McCann with his 15th home run of the year, and it's three to one Atlanta. Braves have really hit some bombs in this series. And that was another one. Well, I want to see what this pitch was. I was focused on my pinch hit triple off Tom <laughs> Seaver, <laughs> and it's not the changeup. This is going to be a fastball. Oh, he wanted a cutter. And guess what? It hung. It was down, but over the middle. And for you kids out there, you can throw it down, but if you get it in the middle, that's still a hanger. So the Braves get that run right back. It's now three to one. Here's Escobar, and he takes a strike. Well, here is the pitch right on the barrel of the bat and down all left-hand hitters. Got it. McCovey would have had that pitch. I don't know how far he would have hit it or Stargell. Man, if it was that easy, everybody would be doing it, right? Well, we mentioned McCann hasn't been having a very good year against left-handers, but he just cracked one against the best left-hander in the business. So point being, Garrett, so we'll get off this Cesar Hernandez matchup. Little did I know I'd only get eight hits the rest of my career off of him. <laughs> 196 with no home run. Hey, he was tough. Are you kidding? He really was. <laughs> he was good. Shoot. <laughs> Anderson Hernandez goes down again and throws out Escobar for the second out. So it's like the old saying, you got to beat up on the teams 500 and under and go 500 against the upper echelon teams. Well, the same thing in pitching. You hope to go 500 against the good pitchers and you got to beat up on the, the mediocre ones. The good ones are going to get you out. Matt Dye is going to come back for his first time up. Up the middle for a base hit. So Diaz now 12 for 22 against Santana. That's four hits off Johan. And Adam LaRoche coming up. Let's check out your Mets upcoming schedule brought to you by your Lincoln Mercury dealers. Series with the Phillies starts tomorrow night. Four games with the Phillies, including day games Sunday and Monday. Don't forget, Saturday night is the big 69 celebration. Then the Mets start a long road trip, three in Florida, three in Chicago, and three in Denver. 
before they come home and by then we'll be past Labor Day and, and on into the, September. It'll be uh, one a week homestand, a week on the road, a week back, a week home. Actually, we won't be past Labor Day. Labor Day's late this year. Yes, it In fact, is. the Mets have off on Labor Day this year. I hate that. Why? Because there's supposed to be baseball on Labor Day and Memorial Day on the 4th of July. No one's supposed to work on Labor Day, Gary. We are. We always work with people who don't. It's the nature of our business. LaRoche ripped a double down the right field line and scored his first time up. And he drives this one to center field, but Pagan is right there waiting for it, and that retires the side. But the Braves had a run. Brian McCann hitting one into the Pepsi porch in right field for his 15th home run of the season. That's 20 home runs Santana's allowed this year, and now the Braves have themselves a 3-1 to one lead. Oh, there, there are our rowers. Now, we send our cameramen out, folks, and get these shots. They're very coordinated. We work row. very hard to bring you the best visuals. Both outside and inside the ballpark. We have a very good director, very good producer, an excellent camera crew. How about the tape operators? What do you think about that? They're wonderful. <laughs> Graphics. Brian Schneider bounces one foul, nothing at one. You know, it takes many hands to make a television broadcast. It does. Often say, you know, being a broadcaster on radio, you're the wheel. Here we're a mere spoke in the wheel. These are the guys who do all the work. They do. They gotta sit there all night in the elements. I know it looks easy. I know it does, but it's really hard, especially when the ball's hit. They have to figure out what to follow. Those guys are on pins and needles, too. Mr. Webb down there in that truck. Well, he gives them the business, you know. I understand. That's those Irish, though, you know. They're tough. <laughs> Webby loves all his cameramen. Well, Bill had a big say in where, you know, when the stadium was built in the beginning, as far as where the positions of the cameras were going to be. Schneider pops one up behind the mound. Not to belabor a point. And Escobar grabs it one away. Follow the Mets on your iPhone and iPod Touch with MLB.com at Bat 2009, featuring play-by-play -play video highlights and live audio broadcast. Visit Mets.com on your iPhone or iPod Touch to purchase. Another muggy night. Another nice crowd. Anderson Hernandez tried to bunt and popped one up to Adam LaRoche's first time up. Each team with four hits. The Braves lead three to one in the fourth. 
And she and Kawakami trying to win for the first time since the All-Star break. Kawakami's pitched pretty well. The difficulty for him for most of the year has been pitching deep into games, but his last two starts, he's worked into the seventh inning both times. And that's an improvement for him. Kawakami, only three times in his first 20 starts, worked more than six innings, but now he's done both of his last two starts. And that's certainly helpful for the Braves, resting their bullpen a little bit as they head down the stretch, particularly with the shoulder problems that have been plaguing Rafael Soriano, their closer. One and one to Hernandez. Lifted foul down the left field side and out of play. Well, Gary Sheffield, a late scratch from the lineup, and there are uh, some reports out there about the circumstances regarding Sheffield's being scratched tonight. And uh, Kevin Burkhardt is gathering information, is going to have a report a little bit later on on Sheffield. Hernandez loops one to left field. And Gorecki easing back to make the play. Two out. So two up and two set aside. New York Mets baseball is brought to you by Tri-State Ford. Check out the best-selling vehicles in America only at your Tri-State Ford dealers. Here's Santana who struck out his first time up. By the way, yeah. you ask a question these days, through the miracle of Google, you get an answer. The voice of Chumley. Bradley Bulky, brother of who's Dayton Allen? I have no idea. That's why I didn't say it. Now we have to find out who Dayton Allen was. Oh, gee, Tennessee. Oh, gee, Tennessee. <laughs> Let's go see Mr. Whoopi. Pulled down to first and passed LaRoche down the line. It rolls into the deep corner as Santana busts it for second. And takes the safe path with two out. Stops with his third double of the year. Probably could have made it for three as that ball stuck in the corner for Diaz. Well, you know what? You've got your pitcher out there. It's a hot night. You're always going to play safety first. But watch him at the bottom of your screen. He's hustling from the get go. Nice swing. And he had three out there. Yeah. But you got to pick up. With a ball behind you, you kids, pick up your third base coach. I think with one out, Razor probably sends him. With two out, no sense taking the extra chance. And again, it's your pitcher. You're right, Garrett. It's very good. With one out, he probably would have sent him. And he did a great job picking up the coach. That's what you're supposed to do. Here's Angel Pagan trying to get Santana in. Angel has struck out and flied out. And he's late on the fastball. Nothing in one. Well, here you go. Now the ball down the right field corner. Now it just it's over your shoulder. Pick up your third base coach. Rely on him. And you wanted to go three, but I tell you what, it's the right move. And you know what, Keith? So many times this year, we've seen runners in the same situation, looking not over their left shoulder at the third base coach, but over their right shoulder to try and see where the ball is. Well, a lot of times too, if you can make your decision. I mean, if you got a speedster. Uh, Reyes, let's just keep it contemporary. He hits the ball down that corner. Reyes is going to round second, first base. He knows halfway to second base that he's got three. He can make that read. Mm -hmm. And doesn't need the third base coach. Well, it's harder for Santana, who's had only one triple in his career. So he hasn't had much experience with that. Late swing foul, one and two to Pagan. And let's see if he drops the off-speed pitch on him now. One and two ahead in the count. Castillo on deck. Well, Kawakami struck out Pagan with that slow curve ball back in the first. Into the air to right. Diaz back. Side retire. 
So Kawakami works around the two on double by Santana. Johan back to the mound for the fifth with the Braves up three to one at City Field. With the Braves leading the Mets three to one. Johan Santana yielded a home run to Brian McCann in the fourth inning and home runs have been something of a measuring stick for Santana lately since the middle of June. Santana has won all five starts in which he did not allow a home run. But he's 0 and 5 in the seven starts in which he's given up a home run. It'll be Ryan Church Kenshin Kawakami and Omar Infante up for the Braves in the fifth. Church with a double in that two run third inning RBI double right down the third first baseline. Church getting a chance to play center field every day right now for the Braves with Nate McClouth on the disabled list with a hamstring injury. So did we find out the voice of Phineas J. Whooping? We did. A surprise. I had no I idea. No idea on myself. Larry Storch. Larry Storch from S Sergeant Agarn. Uh, no, Corporal F Agarn. F Troop. F Troop. How about that? I did not know that. Bet you thought it was an older gentleman. Pulled into right field, and Church has another hit. So Ryan had three hits last night. A double, and now a single tonight. And the Braves have the leadoff man on against Santana in the fifth. Well, Church, three hits last night, two for two tonight. First ball fastball hitting yeah. it looked like. Well we were talking about Gary Sheffield and the circumstances of him being scratched from the lineup. Kevin Burkhardt has more. Kevin? Well certainly a strange day around these parts Gary. Um, you know it started out really with, with Jerry Manuel whose press conference with the media was about 50 minutes late today and um, you know Gary Sheffield just before Jerry met the media actually walked into the clubhouse as Kawakami sacrificed Santana going for the lead runner and he gets him. Relay to first is not in time. A little high. Hernandez to throw pulls Castillo off the bag, but Johan gets the lead runner there. Check the replay here. Anyway, continue the story. Sheffield came in the clubhouse just before Jerry met the media, just kind of shaking his head with an incredulous look and said, Man, I got to clear my mind. I got to clear my mind. A couple of us asked if he wanted to talk. He said no and went out of the locker room. And basically, what came out a little bit later today is Joel Sermon of the Post reported that Sheffield went into the Mets front office in Omar Mania and asked for a contract extension. Well, the Mets uh, apparently batted that down, and that's what caused Sheffield to get to the point where he almost threatened to walk out of the team. Obviously, he didn't do that. He's here with the team. I could not get the Mets to get back to me with a comment on their stance in the situation. But, um, guys, I can tell you this uh, probably stems from the fact that the Mets had put him on waivers and then pulled him back. And, and maybe this comes from the fact that they did not trade him to the team that claimed him. But either way, here's the bottom line. Gary Sheffield is unhappy. He's still with the team as of this point. Back to you. 
Well, we'll certainly be following that story, and I'm sure there'll be much more said and written about it in uh, in the coming days. Well, I think what's important to note is that you know Gary Sheffield has no agent. He is his he he represents himself. Toward the hole and a base hit for Infante. Now Akami pulls into second. Second hit of the inning off Santana. Well, there are a few things here. One is that um, Larry Brooks in the post day before yesterday had a story that didn't seem to make a lot of sense at the time, and maybe it seems to make a little more sense now. He said that, um, and he quoted Gary extensively in the story, he said that Sheffield um, had been put through waivers as, as um as Kevin just said, had been claimed and pulled back and that the Mets hadn't dealt him, but that Sheffield did not expect to finish the season with the Mets. And it seemed strange at the time because the only way that Gary would not finish the season with the Mets would be if they put him on irrevocable waivers, which means that they couldn't pull him back. But that didn't make any sense because the Mets had nothing to gain from that. They're, they're hardly paying Sheffield anything. They're paying him the minimum salary this year. The Tigers are paying the rest of his salary. And, and they would get nothing in return. Well, it would seem as though that the possibility of Sheffield not being here the rest of the year must have come from Gary himself because it didn't make any sense any other way. And I guess what's happening today probably is an extension of, of those feelings. And, um, you know, beyond that, we don't know anything. What we do know is that you know, Gary's had a habit over the course of his career periodically of having these contract discussions in public as a base into the left field for Gorecki and now the bases are loaded. So Reed Gorecki the Long Islander out of Kellenberg Memorial High School who had his first big league hit last night now has his second. Well, base is loaded. And, you know, Sheffield has always been a guy that speaks his mind, has been controversial. And it, but I think he's basically a guy that, you know, he's going to say what he has to say. And he's not going to, you know, he's going to say it in, in, fr in front of the press. It, it, he can be controversial that way. He speaks his mind. So we'll see how this plays out. Well, here's the unfortunate part. This team has had so many bad things happen to them this year. As Chipper hits one on the ground, nice play by Hernandez. Out of second, Castillo to first, and in time for the double play. Beautifully done. 6-4-3, Hernandez and Castillo turning it over on Chipper Jones to get Santana through the inning. Outstanding play by both shortstop and second baseman to turn the double play and get the Mets through the inning. It. 
A zero at the top of the fifth inning for the Braves, thanks to some stellar infield defense by the Mets to keep it a 3-1 game. Well, beautiful backhand by Anderson Hernandez. Quick feed, beautiful to Louie, and Louie makes the play. He makes the turn with the runner bearing down on him with a strong throw, and they did get him. That just saves a run right there. If Anderson doesn't make that play, this game's broken open. So Castillo will lead off the bottom of the fifth of the Mets down by two. I was going to say right before we went to the break, the unfortunate thing about this uh, this little matter with Sheffield is it's been enough bad things happen to this team this year. Um, you know, you've got 41 games to go after today. There's a lot of baseball for the Mets to play under difficult circumstances with a, a depleted group trying to you know, not go into free fall over the last six weeks of the season. And, and the last thing you need is a distraction involving one of the few established players that you have left. Well, over any player, whether he's established or not, you don't need any more distractions. And, you know, you've got a manager that, uh, you know, he's, he wants to come back next yeah. year. And, you know, just you, you hope that um, they can there be a credible effort out here and, uh, you know, I agree with you. They just don't need anything else at this at this juncture of the season. Yeah. What what, what you hope is that whatever it is, they resolve it. Front office and, and Gary and Gary get back to playing and, and finish the season strong. And because if he wants to play next year, whether it's for the Mets or anybody else, the best thing he can do is to continue to play well over the last six weeks. Absolutely. It is to his benefit. Here's Castillo, who's walked and singled the left. He's scored the only Mets run tonight. He takes a strike. Castillo's had himself a remarkable offensive stretch. He's six for eight in this series, and over the last eight games, 12 for 23. He's got his average up to 312 for the year. And as always, looking at a lot of pitches, drawing a lot of walks, on base percentage over 400. Anderson Hernandez after that terrific play. Louie at 312 right now. Only twice in his long career has he ever hit higher than that for a season as he takes a call third strike from Kawakami, who has his fourth strikeout of the night. Today's game is brought to you in high def by Verizon Fios. If you're not watching at Fios HD, see what you're missing. Call 1-888-GET-FIOS. Let's check in with Kevin. Guys, I, I talked to Daniel Murphy today, and, and I asked him basically to take me through his first full season in the big leagues and to, to walk me through it and to assess what he's gone through here. It's, wow, that's some shattered bat. Ball goes foul. And, you know, what it came down to really is not so much the on-the-field stuff. Obviously, there's things he wants to improve, but it's really the routine of getting through the rigors of an everyday uh, life in the major leagues. And, Keith, I know you can speak to this when I'm done, but this is a guy throughout his whole life that whenever he's gone into a slump, whenever, uh, you know, times have gotten tight, all he's done is work harder. So that means going to the cage, taking about 100 swings, and working himself into the ground. That hasn't been a problem before, but when you're playing, you know, 150 games, it certainly changes the outlook a little bit. So he said, basically, I had to get used to this year doing something completely different than I never did my whole career, and that's working smarter, not working more. And that really was a hard thing for me to grasp. Is like spring training, you know, we're doing that 80 pitch drill with Jerry Manuel, and I'm taking 150 cuts before that. Like, what am I doing? So. A lot of it is routine for him. He's talked to Alex Cora about getting set in his ways, and he drives one well the other way here, and Gorecki will haul it in. And Cora told him, look, you got to find yourself a routine, and that is waking up the same time, doing the same things, finding what's right as far as how many swings to take in the cage and things like that. And for Murphy, his goal by the end of the year is to get that regimen down. He said it might change in spring training a little bit, but I want to at least feel comfortable with myself, knowing that going into next year, I have myself prepared for a full major league season guys very good report there Kev and um, I tell you I I, I I think that um, they, there's too much cage hitting today and there's no reason to take 150 swings every day in the course of a season I mean in spring training okay you, that, that's that's where you get your work in and when you're in a slump I never like to hit in the cage the cages are much better now to hit in and these hitters are more Okay, they grow up hitting in, more, in cages where we never did. Right. And, you know, I always wanted to see where I hit the ball in the field. If I was in a slump, I'd come out early and hit on the field, um, and hit on the field extra and get my extra swings. But it was, was never 100 swings, even when I was in a slump. Well, what's the danger of too many swings in the cage, well, if you see it? Is, no, it, is, it, is it a fatigue factor? Well, not even in the cage. In, in the, it could be. But these guys are in shape. 
um, you can get arm wearing. Uh, but you get in bad habits when you take too many swings. You start making, you, you get tired in your hands and your arms, and then you start making, you know, you just get, you, you just get a little bit lazy or tired, and you start getting in bad habits. I never liked hitting off a machine. I know they have lots of machines. I did like the curveball machine. Uh, that there was the two tires back in my day that you could tilt, and they threw the curveball. And I love that getting the biggest, slowest curve, the slowest speed. I, that was very beneficial for me, pretty much what Jerry did in spring training with this club. But when you're playing every day, and when you're red hot, we was always told the Lord only gave you so many hits in a hot streak. Don't waste them in the cage or in BP. There were days, Gary, when I was red hot, I'd go out and take one round, get loose, and that was it. Strike three called. Frank Cora down looking, and Kawakami has his fifth strikeout of the night. Five in the books now at City Field. Three to one could land you some amazing seats at City Field during every Mets game here on Picks. We're giving you a chance to score free tickets to an upcoming game. Brought to you by the new McCafe coffees made with fresh ground espresso now at McDonald's. Tune into the Picks game of the week all season long for your chance to win free Mets tickets. There's some folks who found themselves some tickets tonight and having a great night out at the ballpark. Hanging out near the, uh, the bridge in right center field. It is a nice night out. And this does, ballpark does offer a lot of ambiance. Brian McCann leading off in the sixth. Then he takes a strike. McCann parked one in the second deck in right field in the fourth inning. His 15th home run of the year. Remember earlier in the year, but McCann had the trouble with his eyes. Wearing glasses now. They tried contacts. That didn't help. And there's the home run on a hanging slider or a cutter. And... McCann seems to have found the right glasses. See the ball, hit, hit it. The ball. That's simple. Well, the Braves have hit six home runs in this three-game series, and the majority of them have been crushed. Oh. McCann pops one up behind first base. Castillo calling off Murphy, one away. Who's Hot is brought to you by Halloween 2 in theaters August 28th. Derek Jeter up to 331 on the year with his recent hot streak. Joe Maurer, he's hitting 380 now. He's been amazing. Wow. And uh, Ubaldo Jimenez with the Rockies helping keep them in the wild card lead. He's got a great arm, having a terrific month of August. And the Rockies are winning tonight in the bottom of the sixth against Washington, 2-0. And, and the Giants lost this afternoon in Cincinnati 
on a walk-off home run in the bottom of the tenth by a kid named Drew Stubbs, his second big league game, and he gets a walk-off home run. Uh, first round pick out of the University of Texas for the Reds a few years ago. Florida starting out a little later in Houston. They're up one nothing in the bottom of the second. That's early. Phillies just went way ahead of Arizona. They're just on a roll. Six to three there in the bottom of the fifth. Jason Worth another home run. 28, 28 now. What a player. I mean that's your complimentary player. You've got 28 home runs. Him and Feliz. Mm -hmm. Escobar takes a strike two and one. Well, there was a pitching staff right there. Philadelphia was Achilles heel and now with the acquisition of Cliff Lee who's 4 0 since coming over from Cleveland and Pedro. They've got a doggone good starting five. Well, those additions have certainly helped but the progression of Jay Happ and the surge by Joe Blanton. Yep. Kept them afloat before those guys arrived. Agreed. And Jay Happ has uh, got a good chance to be uh, rookie of the year. Mets will face Happ here on Saturday night. Happ is now 9 and 2 with a 2.66 ERA. Who's the other rookie that's 8 and 2? Well, you got Hanson with the Braves. Right, he's right here. Two. And you got um, Randy Wells for the Cubs, who has pitched extraordinarily well also. You know, disappointing year for Chicago. Line into left field, and Escobar has his first hit of the night. That's hit number eight against Santana. A one out single. We'll take a look at the change up grip. Definitely. Too much plate. Oh, it's in. So a little trouble with command today for Santana. Giving up, as they would say, scattered eight hits through five and a third. Got a great defensive play from the middle infielders. A double play to end the inning with the bases loaded off Chipper Jones. Diaz chases the changeup, nothing in one. Diaz had a comebacker in the second, then single to center in the fourth. Now 12 for 22 in his career against Johan Santana. Not too many guys are hitting over 500 against Johan. Double play ball right to Hernandez. Castillo turns it. And for the second straight inning, a 6-4-3 double play ends the inning. This one of the routine variety to get Santana through the top of the sixth. The birthday boy, Corey Sullivan, will lead off, and we go to the bottom of the sixth, 3-1 Atlanta. On the 2010 Milan, visit tristatelm.com. 
never too late for pizza. Try to get your carbs. Good for growing young boys. As long as they burn it off. They look like they could use some energy. Get them some cotton candy. <laughs> oh, I forgot you don't like cotton candy. <laughs> what? They, they might love it. Yep, Corey Sullivan likes cotton candy. It's his birthday today, and he's already walked and singled in the only Met run. There's your, there's your cotton candy. When did cotton candy start becoming blue? I mean, when I was a kid, it was always pink. Right. Exactly. I mean, was that a macho thing that they had to add the blue to the pink? I don't know. I have no clue. I also know it still sticks. It makes your fingers sticky. You know, there's something about eating blue food. Other than like you know, blueberries, I mean, oh. blue is not a, a, a natural color for most food. No. One and two to Sullivan with Tatis and Schneider to follow. I find it so interesting all those ridiculous rules that we had when we played. Look at the pine tar on Sullivan's bat above the label. We weren't allowed to do that. We had to have our pine tar below the label. Well, that's why George Brett got called out. Yep. Well, see the, some of the effects of the lighting here at City Field. I love the shape of the lighting here. It's a unique look that you just don't see in any other ballpark. Well, these are big league lights, that's for sure. Where they have them shaped in arcs. Remember uh, when they introduced there? There, you see, almost like uh, three semicircles together. Eyebrows. There you go. That's a good call. Infante nicely to his right, and Sullivan retired for the first time tonight. One out and nobody on. Well, here's your chance to win two tickets to a game at City Field presented by McDonald's and the new McCafe coffees made with fresh ground espresso. Call 1-866-414-2911. And if you're the 11th caller, you'll be loving it at City Field. Here's Tatis. Biggest play in this game so far in the third inning. Mets were down 2-1, to one, had two in scoring position and two out, and Tatis hit a rising line drive to second base. Omar Infante made a leaping grab to rob Tatis of a base hit and save two runs. And right now the Braves lead by two runs. Well, we talked earlier about Tatis being way too quick this year, and as a result, and, you know, Tatis, all first three at bats now, is let off with a slow curveball. Drives this one toward the gap in right center field. That's going to be up the alley and off the top of the fence. Tatis holds at second base with a one out double. 14th double of the year for Fernando as he took it the other way. Well, that's what he needs to do more of. And that's go into that gap. And you see the grip here. Fastball. Yes, down the pipe, down, and that's a ball he could have pulled. But when you're going bad and you're out in front, that's the, the pitch down the middle is the pitch you can either pull it or go the other way. And if you want to get out of a slump, which usually is when you're out in front, that's the pitch you want to drive to the opposite field and into the gap, and that'll get you there. That'll get you back to your groove. Then when you get hot, you can really feel good. Then you can get that pitch right there and pull it. So here is Schneider tying run at the plate. Is grounded to short and popped to short 0 for 2, and he takes the change up upstairs. Schneider 0 for his last 11 and 4 for his last 45. A really nice time for him to break out. Mets now with six hits in the game off Kawakami, who's trying to beat the Mets for the first time. And Fonte makes the play on Schneider for the second out as Tatis moves over to third. Mets have beaten Kawakami twice this year. He's one of only four pitchers with two losses against the Mets this year. Aaron Harang of the Reds, Craig Stammen of the Nationals, and the Giants closer Brian Wilson all have two losses against the Mets this year, as does Kawakami. 
Not that he's pitched badly. The last time he matched up against Santana and allowed just two runs over six and two thirds. But that was enough to beat him. Anderson Hernandez has popped up trying to bunt and fly it out to left. And he takes a strike. Nobody has come out on deck as yet for the Mets. Santana's due up next. Johan's thrown only 64 pitches tonight, and I can't believe that Jerry would bat for him, even if he has a couple of men on him. Right. Well, Santana can swing the bat, too. Right oh. back to Kawakami, who snags it to the out, and then puts a little mustard on it to boot. So the Mets waste a double by Tatis and leave one, and we head for the seventh at City Field. Still three to one Atlanta. Earlier today, Tom and Jerry Kuzman at Craneville, Joe Pignatano will, were teaming up with uh, City and Habitat for Humanity to put the finishing touches on a condominium complex that will house 41 families in Brownsville. The 69 Mets in attendance all signed a home plate that will hang in the community room there. A joint effort between City and Habitat for Humanity involving the 69 Mets and just a, a nice touch for those guys as they Spend a few days here in New York and ready for the big celebration on Saturday night. Very nice. Wasn't Habitat for Humanity started in the Carter administration? Well, I Jim, believe it was. Jimmy Carter's been very, uh, yes. very instrumental in Habitat for Humanity. Lower third of the order for the Braves in the seventh inning. Adam LaRoche doubled and scored back in the third. One for two on the night. Ah, oh, look at a little cutie. That is sweet. I think she's camera struck. Everybody wants to be on TV, you know. Whenever I see young girls, I think of Maurice Chevalier. Thank heaven. Wasn't that uh, Gigi? Yeah. Luis Jordan, Armani Gingle, Leslie Caron, of course. And I believe it was, it was a Jaja Gabor, wasn't it? Or was it Ava? I think it was Jaja. Scandalous. <laughs> Jammed him and LaRoche pops one up. Schneider gives a look, but it's out of play. That was also Liza Minnelli's father who directed that film. Vincent Minnelli. Yep. One, two. Blowing away with a slider. Santana's pitch count extremely low tonight. He has not walked a batter and he struck out only two. He's had a lot of quick at bats, but he has given up three runs and eight hits. And so far, that's been enough for the Braves with Kawakami pitching well. 
ripped down the right field line and just foul. A bullet that was almost a home run. Just hooked foul. And he ran that guy's lap. You see that? Off the ricochet? Yep. Right in the lap. And he didn't the... catch that ball. That ball caught him. <laughs> Sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. Another one down the right field line. Higher trajectory. Same result. Foul ball into the Pepsi porch. Well, these are not very good signs that they're turning on a fastball inside on Santana. Well, Johan's velocity has been down tonight. He's been in the 90 to 91 range for the most part. Well, he's been in the high 80s, too. Yep. And that's all it takes, you know. Another one pulled it to right field. Well, he kept trying to get that fastball in on LaRoche, and LaRoche kept pulling it and finally hit one fair. Pretty impressive at bat for Adam. He is just raging hot right now. Well, let's see again at a pitch. Maybe he got a fastball grip. He's going to come in. Oh, he didn't get in enough. He nailed it. Third time tonight, the Braves have had the leadoff man on. Ryan Church already two for two. has pulled a double to drive in a run and pulled a single. So five hits the last two nights for Church. With the pitcher on deck, Church takes a change up for a strike. There's Kawakami, who has thrown 91 pitches through six innings. But again, looking to push a little further, which he had not been doing until recently. Oh, little girls love their daddies. Broken back grinder, Castillo makes the turn to get the force at second. Nicely handled by Castillo, who made sure he got one. And he got the lead one. Another fastball come. Oh, boy. How did that bat? Shatter like that. I it's just because they use such light wood. I just think that they lose a lot of the that ball was not hit off the end of the bat. I mean, is that a bat did that to me? I'd tell you what, I'd order a new dozen. They just don't make wood like they used to. Well, didn't Louisville Slugger, they had a fire a long time ago and they lost a lot of their good wood decades, a couple decades ago when I was playing. And they were very concerned that they, you know, they they let that wood sit, and a warehouse caught on fire, and a lot of their bats got the wood got they weren't bats, they a lot of the wood got burnt up. Do you think a, as high a percentage of players uses Louisville Sluggers as used to? No, no, and it was only two bats when I played, right? Two two bat companies, right? Adirondack and Louisville Slugger, of course, and then. Adirondack was bought out by Rawlings. 1-4 on the sacrifice, moving Church to second with two out. And now you have a lot of uh, Maple. boutique bat manufacturers. Right. Maple. I think Maple should be outlawed, to be honest with you. It's Here's too, Cowbell Man. Too hard of wood. Just let the players groove their bats again. Stay with the white ash. That man can whack a cowbell. Oh. On it, Pin Man. See, we have another famous fan. Cowbell Man and Pin Man. That's two big time fans joining forces. It's like a pinhead. <laughs> Here's Infante, who's one for two. Sacrifice fly and had a base hit his last time. Hits one out to left for Sullivan to handle. And so Santana is through seven. He's due to lead off at the bottom of the inning with the Mets down three to one.
stretching. Mets down three to one. The Audi tour of the stadium is brought to you by Audi and your local Tri-State area Audi dealers. Visit TriStateAudiDealers.com. Look at the Acela Club and some of the folks out on the terrace there. That has got to be one of the best places yep. to watch a game right behind that left field foul. Ball. I think it, I, I sat up there. I remember the one game they had me uh, back in May. I do. Running around the stadium. That was my favorite spot. You were up there uh, not having a drink. Uh, well, I'm working. That's what I said. I got to watch what comes out of my mouth when I'm sober. <laughs> Jeremy Reed bats for Johan Santana as we start the bottom of the seventh. And uh, this was not an automatic move, I didn't think. Santana only 77 pitches through seven innings. Mets down by two runs. But Jerry decides to bat for Santana, and he's got Billy Wagner ready to make his return to action. Well, that might be the reasoning there. The whole church got a nice jump on that one. That retires Reed for the first down. I think you're right, Keith, because Jerry said he wanted to get Wagner in tonight, sixth, seventh, or eighth, with what he called a clean inning. In other words, get him in at the start of an inning, to try to get him through three batters. Pitch well, limit will be 20 pitches for Wagner tonight. Well, he's going to go through the teeth of the order. It's going to be uh, Gorecki, Chipper, and McCann. And that's the crowd meter. Wagner has not pitched in a game in more than a year. August the 8th of last season, the last time he went to the mound. And now after Tommy John surgery and all that rehab, he's getting ready for his return. And Pagan has himself a base hit. First of the night for Angel, and the Mets will get the tying run to the plate here in the seventh against Kawakami. Seven hits now for New York. Well, it's a fastball first pitch, and I've told you, I've been surprised how they pitch Tatis with every pitch, first pitch, off-speed curve. Uh, it would be wise to do that with Pagan. Pagan has not quite mastered the off-speed pitch yet from the left side of the plate, and you can see the defense on the infield, particularly note Chipper. Oops. And she builds a step ahead of me all the time. It's a little too quick. Castillo has walked in single tonight. He scored the only mid run, one for two. And he slashes one foul. First pitch fastball hitting. And Chipper playing in at third because Louis is an accomplished drag bunter. And Louis goes that way, opposite field well, hits the ball, and leaves that hole open. But very rare to see Castillo going after that first pitch in these spots. Yes, and I like that. Maybe you know, Louis doesn't feel comfortable doing that. He's more comfortable getting settled into an at bat. Well, he's been a hot hitter. And the Mets need him to get on. You certainly aren't expecting Louie to tie the game with one swing, not as a left-hand batter. Murphy on deck. Mets don't have any power in this lineup to speak of other than Frank Cora, so they've got to get it in other ways. That ball seemed to handcuff LaRoche. I don't know if he lost it in the lights. I doubt it. They got to keep the gun close. And serious threat to steal, even though they're two runs down. If he does, he better make it. Nine steals and 13 tries for Pagan. That's are still first in the National League in stolen bases. Potential double play ball, Infante to Escobar, and despite the good slide by Pagan, the Braves turn the double play, 4-6-3. Billy Wagner will come on for the first time in more than a year. Big moment for Billy when we come back.
pitching for the Mets. Well, in a year that has been marked by injured Met players making exits, how incredibly refreshing to see the entrance of Billy Wagner. His first major league appearance since August 2nd of last year. How about that? 95. He had surgery on his elbow, Tommy John surgery, September the 8th of last year. And yes, less than a year later, here he is back pitching again. A remarkable recovery, and that's due to a lot of hard work. Reed Gorecki trying to punt on him, and he tosses it back one and two. Well, Billy is now 38 years old. And, you know, it's hard enough to come back from Tommy John surgery as a younger pitcher. But for a guy who is 38 and still lives in the mid to upper 90s, perhaps even more remarkable. And the fact that he's not a natural left-hander. <laughs> One and two to Gorecki. Slider fouled off. Well, Billy's comeback so far has been as smooth as it could possibly be. No setbacks along the way coming back from the surgery. Spotless outings in the minor leagues during rehab. Clocked at 94, sometimes 95 miles an hour. And now back on a major league mound. Well, they're not going to pitch him a back to back days. That's for sure. And they're probably going to give him. They said two days off in right. between appearances at least at first. And then who knows? I mean, there's been so much speculation about the Mets perhaps trading Wagner to a contender sometime in the 11 days left before the August 31st deadline. Well, you bet the house that there's scouts here struck him out. Billy Wagner strikes out the first big league batter he faces in more than a year. Well, 96 up the ladder. And that will get some people's attention. Good for you, Bill. Now Chipper Jones. Chipper's 0 for 9 in this series. And Billy starts him with a slider for ball one. And Billy's got 385 career saves. He said, I'm happy to come back in any role just to be back there on the mound. But next year, he said, next year, I'm going to be a closer again. And there's some of the scouts. Already starting to write their reports on Billy yep. Wagner. It's that time of year. Every contender is looking to make that one move before the August 31st deadline to try to put them over the top. 3 0 to Chipper. You can make trades in September, but if you bring a player into your organization after August 31st, they're not eligible for postseason. There are the numbers on Wagner, one of the most dominant closers of his era. I had a hunch they were going to give Chipper the 3 0 hit sign. Frank Kerr over for a look, and he's there to make the grab. Ball stayed there for the second out. Well, most of these scouts are here right now to take us. McCann comes up to the plate, a solo home run back in the fourth. They're here to look at the Braves. The Braves are the team that have a shot for the, for the wild card. And. This is just a bonus here. They're also going to look not just look particularly at the Braves. They're going to look at the Mets also, but. That's plan to limit Wagner to 20 pitches. He's thrown 11 so far. McCann homered into the second deck back in the fourth inning. And he fouls off the fastball, and it's one and one. Well, this is a great sight. It really is. And it's one of the most positive developments that the Mets have witnessed in months. He's throwing bullets. Yeah. 
In for a call strike, and it's one and two to McCann. Fastball away, right to the glove. With the seams. Well, a lot of what ifs, huh? He struck him out. A spectacular return for Billy Wagner. much more than this. In his first outing in more than a year, 11 months removed from Tommy John surgery, Billy Wagner returns with a 1-2-3 inning, a tip of the cap, a couple of strikeouts, 96 on the fastball, good-looking slider, spectacular. Well, most importantly, the 95-96 on the fastball, no strikes like he never like, never skipped a beat. And the congratulations, of course, in the bench, on the bench. And he passed by J.J. Flitz, who has to be thinking, I'm next. Flitz should be ready to go in another week or ten days. Mike Gonzalez brings his Rocky Horse Act to the mound of the bottom of the eighth. You see Gonzalez's numbers here. They got him from the Pirates. Had arm problems. Surgery has come back. He has been solid for this brave team. Murphy tonight one for three, singled back in the third. When the Mets scored their only run. Frankie Rodriguez getting ready for the ninth. And Murphy cracks one to right field. Late start for Diaz, but he gets back there to grab it one away. Inside Edition, America's longest running and top rated news magazine, is coming to picks five nights a week. Don't miss their award winning reporting as Deborah Norville hosts Inside Edition, followed by the only local news at 6 30, the new picks news at 6 30. It's an hour of news at a time when you can actually watch it. The new picks at 6 premieres September 14th on picks. Frank Cord drives one deep, but foul. distance to it. It surely did, but you know what? Unfortunately, it's a long, long strike. Right, Kurt doubled the right center back in the first, since then he's popped to short and taken a call third strike. Well, you've got Frankie Rodriguez, closer, Billy Wagner, closer, and also in that dugout, J.J. Putz, closer. Can you imagine if they had all three of them next year? That would be something. 
Mets have an option on Wagner's contract for next year at about eight million dollars. And uh, you know what? If they get a couple of more outings from him, the way he has looked tonight, why wouldn't you bring him back? Agreed. And when struck Frank Cora hard. Check out your Lexus National League scoreboard. Drew Stubbs, second big league game, walk-off homer in the bottom of the 10th. Reds beat the Giants 2-1. to one. Phillies drawing away from the Diamondbacks, number 32 for Ryan Howard. The Rockies looking to go two up in the wild card, have the lead tonight in Washington, 2-1 in the 8th. Astros lead the Marlins in the 5th. There's J.J. Putz. Should be ready to start a rehab assignment in the next week and then shortly thereafter return to the Mets following elbow surgery of his own to remove bone spurs. Hit down the left field line by Frank Burr and another foul ball. Regina from Copeg is our winner tonight in the McCafe ticket contest. Congratulations, Regina. You'll be loving it at City Field. Tell you what, these fans are loving it tonight. We have heard as noisy a group as we have in some time yes. in a game that, you know, other than Wagner's return, is not how, had a lot going on for it for the Mets. Everybody's into it. It's a good ball game. Uh, you got the Phillies coming in tomorrow. What, Pedro pitching? What day here, Friday? Uh, Pedro pitches Sunday. Sunday. So that's something to look forward to. Two and two to Frank Cora with Corey Sullivan on deck. Two two from Gonzalez. Change up, bounce to third. Another broken bat as Chippers throw is wide and LaRoche came off the bat. And Frank Cora is safe. An error on Chipper Jones, and that'll help the Mets get the tying run to the plate. Well, LaRoche could have gone two ways here, and, and the throw is into the line. You can go, he opts to go outside the line in foul territory with a stretch. He could have come inside the line and made the tag easily. Come off the bag, make the play, tag Frank Corp. LaRoche felt that he got back to the bag. Let's see. Comes off here, but does he go back? Oh, he's on it. He's got a great. Well, it's close. Ball driver, the first base umpire with the call. And he should have made the tag. Come off the bat, inside the line, down the line, towards home plate to make the tag. Well, with the lefty in the game and Corey Sullivan due up, Gary Sheffield, who was scratched from the lineup tonight under less than ideal circumstances, will come up to pinch hit, carrying the tying run. As Kevin reported earlier, there have been multiple reports tonight that Sheffield today went in and asked for a contract extension, was turned down, and was upset enough that he asked for the day off today. Well, the day off is over. He's in the game with a chance to tie it with one swing. Gary's gone 79 at bats without a home run since June the 29th. And he takes a slider for a strike. Chipper Jones playing very deep at third and guarding that line. Very deep in the outfield, playing Shep to pull. And Gonzalez gets ahead 0-2, and, and Sheffield's not happy about that. Another slider. It's high, but breaks inside corner. Didn't leave it over the middle, and Shep's out in front. Now it's 0-2, and that one crossed up McCann, and he somehow keeps it in front of him to keep Frank Cora from moving up. I'm not so sure it crossed him out there. Well, he's set up inside. Why would he throw it? A change up inside. That looked like that might have been at a breaking ball. He just got away from him. Nice play. That nevertheless, just the way he had his glove turned when the ball came out of the dirt like he wasn't expecting it. In any event, he I'm, keeps Frank Cora at first. Nice play. Set, keep the double play in order. One and two to Sheffield. 
popped it up foul, but it come out of play. And he better be careful if he's going to go up the ladder on Chef. He better get it out of the strike zone. Because Chef is Tomahawk City. Oh boy, right on that one. Just high enough to get up, uh, up above the bat. Fernando Tatis on deck. Well, that man's got to be feeling awfully good. Something he's waited a long time for. Oh! Well, it got away from Gonzalez, two and two. Just a little high. McCann reaching up. Had to be as tall as Carlton Fisk. From the great state of New Hampshire, catch that ball. Is Carlton from New Hampshire? Yes. Two, two. Swing and a miss. He got it. Gonzalez strikes out Sheffield two out. Well, he got that curveball down out of the strike zone. Got Chef fishing. And you can see, you can probably see the circle on this ball. Let's take a look. See that little circle? Yes, you can. That's what a hitter says. That's just the back side of the ball. It's the same on the front. So now Tatis, who's hit the ball well tonight, lined out in the third. A great play by Infante to save two runs and then drove one to right center for a double in the sixth. And oh. that one misses badly, a curveball that got away. So uh, Gonzalez had a couple of those breaking balls slip out of his hand. Corey at first with two down. That's down by two in the eighth. And a breaking ball strike, one and one. Well, Gonzalez has to be very careful here. Tatis has got some pop. And that's a hanger. That Tatis is striding too quick. He's getting committed too early. Fernando. Ryan Schneider next. Way inside. Now it's three and one. A walk with the tying runs on base. Tease with six home runs this year. Three and one. And the breaking ball misses ball four. So now the tying runs are on base. That's the first walk by anybody in this game since the first inning when Kawakami walked a pair. Schneider being called back. That's up Santos, Valdez, and Green, right hand hitters on the bench. And it's Santos is going to get the call. So with Schneider struggling mightily right now at the plate on the left hander in the game, Almir Santos will get the pitch hitting assignment. Well, does Bobby, has Bobby had any bit up in that bullpen? I know it's kind of difficult to see. A little murky. Bobby Cox. Apparently has a right-hander because he's heading up the dugout steps. Yep, that's, that's Peter Boyle in the side armor. i got to believe it's going to be a way for the announcement of the pinch hitter, Santos, and that's going to be it. So Gonzalez retires two hitters. An air and a walk and put the tying runs on base, and Boylan will come on to face Santos. This call to the bullpen brought to you by Burger King. We'll be right back.
Amco, double A, beep, beep, MCO. That's teamwork, my friend. We're like uh, Laurel and Hardy. Oh, there goes the glove. Well, he can't be happy about walking Fernando Tatis and having to give way to the side-arming Aussie, Peter Moylan. Well, Peter Moylan, this will be his 66th game, and I believe that ties in with Mr. Feliciano for the league lead in appearances. He came back from surgery last season, the Aussie. Throws side on, throws down under, and from down under. Very consistent. <laughs> but he's doubly tough on right-hand hitters, and Jerry has no other lefty on the bench. He used Reed, remember, back in the seventh inning, pitch hitting for Santana. And not pictured in those stats for Moylan, the fact that he has not given up a single home run this season. Oh, he just shot the clown. Hope so. Here comes Santos with two out and two on. That would be a Met win. Well, Santos has hit home runs before this season against people who are unlikely victims. He may have provided the the best moment all year for this team with his home run off Papelbon in Boston. Very interesting pull on the infield, other way in the outfield. Line right center field, falling in, base hit. A well third comes Frank Corey, he'll score. Church wisely throws to third. It's an RBI single for Almir Santos, and the Mets draw with it a run. Three to two at left. Well, nicely done, Omer. Off the bench, no easy task, particularly off this side armor. Gets a fastball. Too much plate, goes right with it. Nicely done. Church couldn't get there. Francoeur made him throw. Watch. Not Francoeur. Francoeur's going to score easily. Tatis makes the hard turn. Force the throw. Anything may happen. He might throw it into seats. So now Anderson Hernandez with a tying run at second base. Anderson's 0 for 3 tonight, and he takes one wide from Moylan. Hernandez has popped up trying to bunt, fly out to left, and line one back to the pitcher, Kalakami. An unearned run for the Mets here in the eighth, and now trying to get even. Two and out. Well, the Mets have a very limited bench. They're down to Andy Green and Wilson Valdez, and it's Green who has come out on deck. The bat for Billy Wagner. Wouldn't it be something if the Mets could get a lead here and get Wagner a win? Well, that bet would be amazing. 2-0 to Hernandez. Swinging, and he grounds one right to the second baseman, Infante. And the Mets will settle for just one run in the bottom of the eighth. Santos with the pinch hit RBI single. K-Rod will come on to try and keep it a one-run game as we go to the ninth at City Field with the Mets down three to two.
easier and greener way to City Field. Visit Mets.com or call 718-507-TIXX for your tickets now. Changes for the Mets as we go to the ninth. Wilson Valdez comes in to play left field. He'll bat ninth. Omir Santos will stay in to catch after his pinch hit single. Drove in a run. And Frankie Rodriguez will pitch. He has not been to the mound since Sunday. Well, this has been a kind of a peculiar season for Frankie. We've probably been in more games, Gary, where he's come in with a team behind or in non-save situations. Yudel Escobar leads off in the ninth inning. Well, Frankie's last outing was a terrific one. He came into a tie game on Sunday against the Giants, struck out the side, and then the Mets won it in the bottom of the ninth on Daniel Murphy's walk-off hit, and Frankie wound up the winning pitcher. Trying to back up the work of Billy Wagner, who brought some electricity to the joint tonight with his return from Tommy John surgery in a fashion which uh, Billy could have only dreamed of. A one, two, three inning with a couple of strikeouts. 2-0 to Escobar, and it's taken high 3 and 3-0. Santana went the first seven and threw just 77 pitches. Johan allowed three runs and nine hits, no walks, two strikeouts. Certainly pitched well enough, but Genshin Kawakami held the mess to just one run over seven. We talked about Kawakami pitching against aces of other staffs and pitching well. Tonight he did. Ran one to Escobar. Matt Diaz and Adam LaRoche to follow for the Braves here in the ninth. And then in the bottom of the inning, the Mets will have Valdez, Pagan, and Castillo do up. Presumably against Rafael Soriano. Ball four, and k -Rod wants the first man to face him. So Escobar is aboard. That is the first walk by Met pitching tonight. It would have been a rare event for Met pitchers to not walk a batter. Remember, the Mets have walked more hitters than any pitching staff in the National League. Here's Diaz, who is one for three. You certainly don't expect the bunt from Diaz. But you do have two left-hand hitters to follow in LaRoche and Church. Uh, he'll be swinging. Could see a hit and run. And Diaz has to bunt. Frankie's got to play in second. Gets the out there. No relay. Well, I don't agree with that. And very seldom do I disagree with Bobby Cox. But you've got a hitter up there who's not familiar with bunting. You've got a red hot hitter who's had a great series. You know, if I'm going to bet safety first, if I want to do something to advance the runner, I'd put a hit and run on. But boy, it was a pitch to hit, too. Nice play by Frankie. That is the second failed bunt attempt in this game by Braves, by the Braves. Kawakami had one in the fifth where Santana got the out at second. Now here's LaRoche with one out and one on. LaRoche having a great series. Two for three tonight. Six for 11 in the three games, including a couple of home runs. This is LaRoche's 17th game back with the Braves, and he's hitting close to 400 in those 17 games. LaRoche began his year as a Pirate, spent a week with the Red Sox before coming back to Atlanta. Ryan Church on deck. Church has had a nice series after taking an 0 for on Tuesday. Three hits last night, two more tonight. Diaz, not much speed at first, although he'll still the occasional base. And again, Frankie falls behind. It's 2-0. Oh. Well, pretty much straight away. All the way around. Doing one to LaRoche. Well, Frankie, only 40% of his first pitch strikes, 47, excuse me, of first pitch strikes. That is Tom Glavin territory. Um, you expect your relief pitcher to come in 
and throw more first pitch strikes than that. Three and one down to LaRoche. Okay. And, and he went through this stretch where he was walking a lot of people a few weeks ago, and he had that um, that meltdown game that he pitched. Was it in San Diego? And uh, gave up the walk-off grand slam to Everett Cabrera. And he came out after that throwing more fastballs and more strikes. But it's been a struggle so far tonight. Three and one. Bobby Cox did not run Diaz. Three and two here. One out. I got to believe he's going to put him in motion. There's Rafael Soriano getting ready in the bullpen. We saw Soriano earlier in the series in a tune up for a save situation. There goes Diaz, pitches high ball four. Second walk of the inning for Frankie Rodriguez, and now the Braves looking for some insurance have two men on. And so the problems with the bases on balls. Jumping up on K Rod again. So now Church with an opportunity to give the Braves a little breathing room. A single and a double tonight. He's scored a run. He's driven in a run. Diaz is at second. LaRoche at first with one out. Three to two Atlanta ninth inning. There's a strike and a change up right there. And, you know, this is coming into the game 55 innings pitched, 30 walks. That's way too many walks for Frankie. You can make that 32 now. Greg Norton out on deck to pinch hit, a switch hitter. Hit hard to second, should be two. Castillo, the backhand flip, and Hernandez does the rest. That's turned their third double play of the night, 4 6 3, to get Rodriguez through the inning. Now the Mets down by a run come up in the bottom of the ninth. Wilson Valdez, Angel Pagan, Luis Castillo try to get it done against Soriano. 3 to 2 at last. and your local Jeep dealers. Buy Burger King. Get delicious two for four dollar King meals every day of the week at Burger King. Limited time only. Price and participation may vary. By HSBC, the world's local bank. By Halloween 2, a Rob Zombie film in theaters August 28th. And by Lexus, who invites you to the Lexus Golden Sales event. Hurry. And September 7th. 
Final score brought to you by Capital One. What's in your wallet? Mets have been behind since the third inning. They got a run in the bottom of the eighth thanks to a Chipper Jones error. Now down by a run in the bottom of the ninth facing the Braves closer, Rafael Soriano. Well, the Braves, this is a huge game for them to win. They're all big for the Braves now. You see Soriano, he's their closer. Big little shoulder problem. A lot, a lot of work, 55th game. He have a home run Friday to uh, Ryan Howard that lost the game. Wilson Valdez leads off the last of the ninth and takes high. Soriano was brought in in a lopsided affair last night to work the ninth inning and get the kinks out with that shoulder having been bothering him. He walked the leadoff hitter but then settled in and struck out the last two including Valdez. Wilson came in to play left field at the top of the inning. Last night he came off the bench, Valdez did, and had a couple of hits. Angel Pagan on deck, then Luis Castillo. It's surprising that LaRoche at first is not guarding the line. Chipper, of course, has to play and is not guarding the line. Valdez punches one foul, and it's one and two. Veteran Wilson Valdez just called up a couple of days ago. Coral went on the disabled list. Alex is back with the team. You see there he had surgery on his thumb yesterday. Things went very well. Here's the one two slam foul. You can just tell right there that all Valdez is doing is going the other way. Two strikes. The corner infielders are deep now on both and both corners. Very shallow in right field. Diaz and center. Not a lot of power. Out of Valdez. They're playing him like a pitcher. One two from Soriano. Reached for it. Bloop. Shallow center. And Church is in just the right spot. One away. This Sunday on the Picks Game of the Week, Chase Utley and the division leading Phillies visit City Field for a battle between bitter and at least rivals. The Mets take on the Phillies Sunday at one right here on Picks. And Sunday will be Pedro Martinez for the Phillies and Oliver Perez for the Mets. The Phillies winning big at home. The Braves need to win to stay six and a half behind Philadelphia. And the Rockies are winning on the road 4 1 at Washington in the night. As Ollie sports the rally cap. But Don lifts one to center field pretty deep, but Church is back and has room and runs it down for the second half. So two up and two set aside on fly balls to Ryan Church in center field and the Mets are down to their final out of the night. Don't forget to keep it tuned here right after the game tonight. Lincoln Mercury post game live. All the interviews highlights Jerry's post game comments. We'll hear from Johan Santana about his start tonight and Billy Wagner about his return all on Lincoln Mercury post game live. Castillo is one for three, scored the only met, the first Met run back in the third inning. And Louis takes ball one. Castillo hitting a 310 on the year. Started tonight at the top ten of the National League in batting for the first time all season. Chipper again in tight at third base, not guarding the line. Now look at LaRoche. He's guarding the line, and Louis, who very rarely pulls the ball. Interesting. One and one to Castillo. Trying to get Daniel Murphy to the plate. Soriano, very methodical on the mound. He just takes his time, like Lee Smith. He's kind of ambling about. It's a good call. Line over short, a base hit for Castillo. And the tying run is aboard. Another two hit game for Luis Castillo. Boy, he is just wearing it out. Now Soriano's got to worry about a potential steal here. And this is fastball away. Nicely done, Louis. Right up at the plate. Luis Castillo is now 7 for 11 in this series. He's the tying run at first with two out. And now Daniel Murphy. Who is one for four? Single to left back in the third. And he pops it up. Chipper Jones waiting for it to come down. And the ball game is over. 
Soriano saves it for Kenshin Kawakami as the Braves beat Johan Santana and take two out of three in the series. Well, a fine ball game tonight and a night that...